Hi, and welcome to Ones and Twos, FP's economics podcast. Every week we take a couple of data points, we use them to try to explain the world. I'm Cameron Abadi, FP's deputy editor, with you in Washington from FP's own podcast studio. As always, Adam Twos is with us, FP's economics columnist and Columbia University professor. This week, Adam is in Chicago. Hi, Adam. Hi, Cam. So in the second half of the show, we are going to be answering some listener questions. So stick around for that. But first, we're going to be talking about Halloween. And while we're on the subject of Halloween, we thought we would slip in another scary subject, namely British Prime Minister Liz Truss. Her term as Prime Minister is coming to a precipitous end after only 45 days in office. Adam, I guess I don't have a very specific question here, but What do you make of this one month prime ministership of Liz Truss? What went wrong exactly? We've talked about her before. What's your assessment? Yeah, I mean, you've got to feel a degree of sympathy for the women, right? I mean, it's it's a kind of catastrophic legacy. She goes down in history as the most disastrous prime minister the country's probably ever had. Um, It's a bitter legacy. I I think it's a problem that was a while in the making. I mean, my read of Kwarteng and Truss is that they were basically kind of reared on the Brexit myth, right? They were reared on the on this sort of politics of bluff that basically thought they could call the the bluff of, of the establishment of the British establishment of markets, of of the institutions of economic policy making as as Johnson and the Brexiteers did in 2016. And um they came up against a, a brick wall. Um, and I think it's important to understand what that is, because what's really interesting right now is how the crisis in Britain is being rewritten as a lesson in fiscal irresponsibility, right? That the problem is that they they did this giant energy package and then they followed it up with these tax cuts. And then you end up in this rather bizarre position of saying that the, the city of London freaked out because of a 45 billion tax cut principally directed at the city of London or people like them. Uh, which, which isn't a terribly plausible story about what happened, um, as popular as it is and as widely as it's now circulating. And I think you have to understand that as itself, as it were, a, a convenient rereading of the crisis. And, and it isn't that I don't think this policy was totally irresponsible, of clearly it was, and that it does certainly push the British budget deficit sky high and will pile up more debt. And especially on top of the energy crisis in Europe, it comes at a deeply embarrassing time. But the two other elements of this story, which are of much more general interest and behind the scenes are the reasons why people are more than just kind of curious about the incredible uh, soap opera that is British politics right now, are to do with the position of the Bank of England and the way in which the UK Treasury market worked or rather didn't work. And those were the subject of very serious conversation behind the scenes at the IMF and World Bank annual uh, autumn meetings um, in DC recently. Because those two things matter, because what they show is the tensions within the global financial system that are being unleashed by the tightening of monetary policy that is a global phenomenon right now. And one way of reading the UK is how sensitive the financial system and particularly the bond market becomes to bad political news under the current circumstances. And so the two key things here are that the Bank of England being rather slow to to engage in the monetary policy pivot towards tightening that central banks around the world have adopted has now was positioning itself over the summer as one of the most hawkish. And in, in in the weeks leading up to the crisis was actively pulling back from any kind of support of the British sovereign debt market, the treasury market in the UK known as the gilt market, and in fact, not just not supporting it, but increasingly tightening. So in other words, selling debt into the market if it could. And that destabilizes the debt market. But that is the course on which all of the central banks in the world are embarked currently. At least that's what they say they're trying to do. And what the British case shows is it creates a very considerable vulnerability and a huge vulnerability to bad political news. And the, the third thing that really exploded on the Brits was that there were these derivatives hedging contracts in the British Treasury market to covering a very large part of the market by you know, um, expiring pension funds, not new active pension funds, but expiring pension funds, which were hedging themselves against what for them is bad news, namely falling interest rates. And when interest rates went up, which should be good news for them, backfired and almost blew their balance sheets and the market up. 
And so the question that everyone else in the world should be asking themselves is not could we produce politics as silly as Britain, because that's, you know, that's going to be quite hard. I mean, probably Erdogan is the only person really contending for that kind of like, you know, profoundly crazy economic policy uh, option. What everyone should be asking themselves is what kind of risks are being generated by the central bank tightening and what kind of risks are buried in the obscure end of the um, fixed income uh, derivatives world. And that is a question that really matters for Europe as a whole. And it really matters for the US, where the US Treasury market, which is the big, notionally the big stabilizer of the global financial system, but has been showing repeated bouts of instability, is currently looking remarkably illiquid, not as though, in other words, it could easily absorb any big shocks. And so that's that's where this gets serious. We move away from the sort of, you know, the, the soap opera that is Britain, British politics and conservative politics in particular. Hmm. Beyond that, the real issue with these other two points, where are the risks in the, in the financial system and what is the impact of this monetary policy tightening and where might something break? And because those risks are independent of the ideology yeah. of Liz Truss, yeah. Yeah. this could easily happen elsewhere it sounds like you're saying yeah, i mean easily is a strong thing to say but like, we no one should be complacent about it none of these strat these hedging strategies were on the face of it rational strategies to adopt which i think is why people didn't spend enough time thinking seriously about the systemic implications of everyone doing it uh, you know assuming some rather outlandish scenarios with regard to interest rates well we've already had podcasts about boris johnson and liz Truss, so We'll probably be having another podcast about the next British Prime Minister, I imagine. Whoever that is, uh, we'll know soon enough. But as I mentioned, we do have a data point. That data point is 300,000, as in 300,000 tons. That is the amount of candy that will be distributed on October 31st in the United States for the holiday of Halloween. What's interesting is that in the last four or five years, when the economy is suffering, Halloween spending soars. People love, in an economy like this one, to just get out, let loose, have a little bit of fun. Every for American example, kid grows up with Halloween, and there is a kind of economic core to the holiday. There's about redistributing candy, ultimately. Um, so, yeah, we thought we would discuss. Uh, Adam... Do you happen to know the scale of spending on Halloween every year in the United States? And how does that spending break down between costumes, candy, and decorations? Well, I've, <laughs> I've got the overall spending figure. It's about $10 billion. I'm, I'm not sure that I can break this down with, you know, candy as opposed to... Um, sexy nurse outfits <laughs> or um, you know witch cloaks or all of the other stuff that goes on or pumpkin decorations uh what i can tell you is that that place is halloween at the very bottom of the american anyway annual um spending um rankings so easter spending in the us uh, is about 30 billion dollars presumably mainly on you know chocolates and bunnies and whatever and Christmas is the heavyweight. Christmas comes in at many hundreds of billions, and it's a little bit hard to estimate. I try to get figures for Thanksgiving, which is really tricky. You know, a lot of people in America say Thanksgiving is their favorite holidays. It doesn't involve gifts. Hmm. It's basically just a gigantic grocery shop. And um, that's a little hard to pin down. I saw a figure of around a billion for turkeys. But I would, I would basically say that I think Halloween and Thanksgiving, which come close together, are sort of in the lower end, and they're sandwiched between Easter, which is, you know, this medium-sized spend, and the giant end-of-year Christmas, Hanukkah, uh, Eid, I guess, blowout at the end of the year. A nauseating amount, I suppose. But I am also curious how Halloween has spread internationally in recent years. I guess, has it spread? And, and then are there distinctive local variations of the holiday? Yeah, I mean, as a historian, I, I kind of did the, oh, but... But, but um, Cam, how did it get to America? Like, you know, how did it originally spread to America kind of thing? And, and if you dig into this, apparently the this end, you know, autumn festival, uh, October, November um, transitional festival originates in, in the Celtic tradition of so-called Samhain, hmm. um, which was then taken up in the process of the Christianization of Europe as All Saints Day or All Hallows Eve. Hmm. Uh, and traditionally marked a, a kind of opening of, of the year in a weird sense, this sort of liminal movement between the, the, the lived world and the dead. It was a moment to celebrate all the saints, saints after all being, you know, they become saints by means of martyrdom. So they transition from one world to the other. 
Um, it wasn't actually originally celebrated much, perhaps unsurprisingly in Puritan um, New England because they didn't celebrate anything. So insofar as um, you know, America has a Halloween tradition, it belongs to the more free-living, more southern uh, colonial settlements, which were more Catholic in, un, in influence. Um, throughout the 19th century, a kind of culture war was waged for the control of Halloween with, on the one hand, the kind of rambunctious um, world turned ups upside down kind of carnivalesque version of Halloween competing with a more sedate harvest festival family orientated vision. And it really seems that between the 20s and the 50s, 1920s and the 1950s, that is the modern version consolidated as a children's festival for the autumn before Christmas um, with, you know, the, this, this, uh, this tradition now of, of families processing around their neighbourhoods. Trick-or-treating was civilised as well in the sense that, uh, you know, outrageous vandalism of the early stages was replaced by more sedate threats of, of, minor, of minor vandalism. I can vividly remember the globalisation of Halloween because Britain was one of the societies it first happened to. We moved back from Germany to Britain in the early 1980s and all of a sudden found that apart from bonfire night where the British celebrate you know, the, the prevention of a, of a Catholic prop to overthrow the, the monarchy uh, in the early modern period. There was now this new festival, which was rather scary of, you know, trendy teen teenagers going around at night and knocking on people's doors and being a rather bookish teenager at the time. I used to kind of hide <laughs> from Halloween, I, I remember. And it, it has now spread around the world. Apparently the most Halloween resistant of Europeans, perhaps unsurprisingly, are the, are the French, who are, you know, bitter, bitterly resisting this this nasty American cultural import, which I think is largely spread through Hollywood, really. And, you know, the variety of more or less comic, you know, horror movies that are associated with this moment. There is, of course, a powerful Latin American tradition of, of All Souls Day, but that, by all accounts, is increasingly colonized by the commercialized American model, too, because for all of the grotesque grandeur of the traditional um, Mexican masks, and no one can really resist the candy. Hmm. And I can attest that it has also arrived in Germany. Our kids demand to wear costumes, which for German, older Germans is confusing because they used to only wear costumes at Carnival, which is in February. And so anyway, these costumes just get reused now twice, uh, it seems like every year. You mentioned vandalism as part of the holiday. And yeah, that has always sort of been a peripheral aspect of the holiday in my recollection, especially among teenagers. Is there a kind of measurable negative economic cost in that scale of vandalism? And is there an economic way to think through the causes of those kinds of Halloween transgressions? I mean, would an economist say a costume weakens a sense of personal responsibility, say? I'm not sure whether an economist would be a psychologist. <laughs> a psychologist might. You should try it. Yeah. You should try it, Cam. I, get, get dressed up and uh, put on a mask and you'll see what happens. <laughs> um uh, certainly in New York, it seems to be disinhibiting in more ways than one. Um, the, uh, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, as, as far as I understand it, trick-or-treating at this point in the, certainly in suburban America, where I've encountered like the Halloween thing at its most intense seems to consist largely of wrapping houses in toilet mm. paper, um, which is, you know, quite the thing. But more seriously, if you actually look at the economic statistics, um, there really is a surge, at least in insurance claims. It may be that people simply think that this is the day of the year to make a vandalism insurance claim, huh. but there is a huge surge. There's a 68% surge in vandalism claims, 11% hmm. um, surge in theft and also apparently there's an insurance category called mysterious disappearances <laughs> and those those surge as well from an economic point of view it's difficult to know whether, whether that really constitutes a loss right this is the ambiguity of economics that clearly from the point of view of the household suffering the damage it's a loss but from the point of view of the economy as a whole it's a chance to employ a, a handyman or a craftsman to put the damage right uh, you know and everyone makes out more seriously though and this really is a thing is that it's uh, a major day for drunk driving and for road mm. fatalities. Um, there's a 60% surge in drunk driving fatalities on America's roads on, on, on Halloween. And perhaps most tragically of all, uh, and if you live in suburban America, it really it came home to be quite hard, actually. It's one of the beautiful things about Halloween in suburban America is it's one of the few times of the year that people actually walk around their neighborhoods. Mm. Most people in suburban America you know, step out their front door, go to their carport, get into their car, and then drive. And on Halloween Eve, like, and the people literally just, you know, get their little red wagons and process around their neighbourhoods. And 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 there's, you know, in in small towns, it's it's really a very 
it's really very cheerful and pleasant. Unfortunately, however, when Americans step out of their cars onto the pavement, um, disaster mm. ensues. And it is uh, Halloween is the worst day of the year for pedestrian fatalities in the United States because there are just more people on the street and more drunk drivers. Um, so whatever you're doing out there, um, be safe. Hmm. Yeah, that makes also sense given how many of the costumes are dark in color. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, similarly, I, I'm curious how an economist would characterize the basic transaction involved in trick-or-treating. I mean, it's a kid rings a doorbell, says trick-or-treat, and asks for candy, essentially. From an economist's perspective, is this basically a type of begging? Is it a kind of charity that's going on here? Or is it a type of blackmail, that invocation of a trick alongside the request for a treat? Um, and, and then, I guess, in addition, would an economist identify an inefficiency in giving each kid the same amount of candy? I mean, you could instead offer an incentive for good costumes by offering more candy to the kids who've put more effort into their costumes, say. So, yeah, what is uh, the economic analysis of, of trick-or-treating? I, mean, I seem to remember that we would we would um, at least lavish huh. praise on those with the best costumes. We also, sure. at various points, also resorted to a deterrent strategy of putting on rather scary costumes ourselves and terrifying the children <laughs> to, see, to see whether they had the nerve to still ask for candy. But yeah, I mean, I think the obvious way to model this is as a protection racket, right? Like, uh, hey, your house could be safe from our tricks if only you gave us candy. I mean, that, that is a protection racket. And I think, you know, in a kind of metaphysical sense, that's, I think, how I understand what's going on here, right? That the, I mean, I'm not into the theology or let alone the, you know, the ancient Celtic uh, law that, that governs this. But presumably the idea is somehow that you're, you're like assuaging a spirit that's loose in the world and, right, and by performing this, by performing this ritual of, this weird exchange, um, you are in some way restabilizing or perhaps enjoying or signaling your recognition of this weird way in which the world has opened at this moment so that the passage between life and death is more porous. Um, hmm. And so this is a kind of, it's more in the manner of an offering in that sense. You know, if it's a protection racket, so, you know, it's kind of a metaphysical protection racket. It's like, yeah, we're all good. Like, we love you. Stay where you are most of the year. Um, yeah, it's that kind of so, a, that kind of a relationship. But I do think you're supposed to give everyone the same candy. I, I think I, I think otherwise that that is the socialist element here. You're supposed to all the kids get the same get the same candy. You can praise some, you know, but there's a sliding scale though too, because you know younger kids can't be judged the same as the older kids. Um, anyway, we will leave it there for now, and uh, you know maybe we'll read up on our Celtic rituals and come back to discuss this uh, another time but we'll be back soon to take our, our listener questions okay we're back so we will be addressing a handful of questions from our listeners uh we have gotten an incredible number of very interesting questions left on our website. Here's a handful. There are many more to come. So our first listener question comes from Kayo Brenter. Hey, I'm a big fan of the show I've been following since the very first episode. I had a question about wealth inequality. I feel like wealth inequality has been a topic that like a decade ago, there was a ton of discussion about with like the the Occupy Wall Street movement and I think with like inflation and stuff, I just don't see it get as much attention as it used to, even though there's still a ton of inequality. So I was just kind of wondering, what do you see, if any, as the costs of wealth inequality and also how much could we actually redistribute wealth in the United States? Because I do hear sometimes people say that even though people like Elon Musk have a ton of wealth because it's invested in assets that's not really liquid, it's not really feasible to actually redistribute as much as some people might initially think. And I'm wondering what you think about that argument and how much redistribution is actually feasible. So Akaya brings up a really a crucial point here, um, because income inequality is much more easily measured than wealth inequality. 
because income flows are essentially subject to tax, though, of course, the ultra rich find extraordinary ways of avoiding this fact. Um, whereas wealth is this intangible stock variable um, that depends on valuations on any given moment. But in a sense, wealth inequality is more important because at the higher end of the income pyramid, the top 1% get a very large percentage of their income, not from the sale of labor, but from income earned on assets. And as you go within the top 1%, as you go to the fraction of 1%, this becomes larger and larger and larger until you have business owners who, who don't really labor in any conventional sense of the word and just drive their income from profits. And they're obviously the wealthiest people. The reason why wealth inequality really matters is that it's even more extreme than income inequality. So the top 10% of most capitalist societies really monopolize all of the wealth. I mean, not, not literally all of it, but the vast majority of it. Whereas income, almost by necessity, because people have to live, is, is distributed much, is much further down. And it's sometimes really surprising. So societies like Sweden, for instance, or Germany, that have relatively moderate income inequality, have extreme wealth inequality. And the gap between the two is all to do with the taxation and so on that, that Kaya is also asking about. But you can have, as it were, hidden behind the facade, the facade is not quite the right word, but behind the daily reality of relatively equal European welfare states, persistent structures of massive wealth inequality, which are you know, translated from generation to generation over, over centuries. So can we redistribute this wealth? If, you know, if wealth is so important, can we get it? And the, I mean, the simple answer is yes, you can. But when you do, you're touching the absolute foundation of power. And so typically it happens at moments in like wars, uh, where the imperative of national security overrides the defense of wealth. Or um, it happens in revolutions. You, you could almost say that a revolution is defined by the moment in which wealth rather than income is redistributed, because when you do it, you're really touching the the, uh, the foundations of power. And then, then I guess you'd snap back and say, well, okay, we'll pull the other leg. Obviously, there's no prospect of revolution in the United States or anywhere else in Europe for that matter today, which is absolutely fair. So then can we redistribute wealth outside those sorts of extreme circumstances? And, and this is where we then come to this issue of wealth taxation and how far you can go. And, and the key point that Kai is making is that if you tax wealth in the form of a demand for cash, what you're asking people to do is to translate stock, shareholdings, bonds into liquid cash, which requires them to sell them. Uh, and that will create perturbations in the market. So there are two ways you can deal with this. You could simply ask them to transfer to you the titles. There's no reason for Elon Musk to sell any of his shares in Tesla. He could just simply every year pass a certain percentage of Tesla to the US government. That would be one way of dealing with this problem. The other one is to calibrate the tax such that it can be paid out of current income. So Germany, for instance, after World War II, had a very large wealth tax to compensate those who had been damaged by the war at the expense of those who'd come by good fortune through World War II without much damage to their wealth. And they calibrated it such that the tax could be paid effectively out of the income generated by the wealth over time. And if you do that, then you don't force sales. That, of course, limits the pace at which you can transfer. It is a deliberately progressive, reformist, moderate policy rather than anything remotely revolutionary. But that would certainly be viable. And if it was pursued persistently over time, it could be a very large transfer of revenue into the hands of the public purse, which could then be used for all sorts of different things, retiring existing debt, public expenditure, investment, or just straight transfers to citizens with lower incomes. So this is viable. Um, but if you go wholesale, you have either to consider just simply taking ownership of shares in a company, or you have to calibrate the, the tax at a level which allows it to be serviced out of conventional flows of income short of the sale of the asset. Those are, that's the trade-off you have to make. Our next question comes from John Wright. I was listening to your program on air conditioning, and particularly it was particularly of interest when you mentioned about heat pumps being a possible solution for the future to lower energy use. I was wondering if the opposite may be true when you consider northern European countries like Britain, where air conditioning is almost unheard of in a domestic setting. So in the summer, there's no air conditioning power use at all. Whereas if heat pumps or when heat pumps become more common, then because air conditioning is available, it will be used. So it may actually increase power usage and air conditioning usage particularly. 
in in some countries. So yeah, John, this is a well-known effect in environmental economics, which you bring up here, which is that if you achieve significant efficiencies in a particular resource use, um, this can in fact result in increased use of the resource because it becomes cheaper rather than you know cashing in the cost savings of greater efficiency in the form of reduced consumption, which you might reduced expenditure on on the item so if you make highly efficient um, air conditioning or heating available with air pumps then even if it costs you you know a few dollars uh, a few pounds to to pay for the air conditioning all of a sudden you'll start using it and as you say that will result in a in a surge in energy consumption and i think the point to emphasize is that policymakers can see this problem coming and um, have reacted to it and so smart policy is the answer here. And the crucial thing to understand is that European heat pumps are not the same as American heat pumps. So when Americans hear heat pumps, they think dual use, heating, air conditioning, air to air units, because many Americans heat with air, as well as cooling air. Um, this is a very, very expensive way of heating and cooling. Um, and it's not the normal way for either heating or cooling um, in Europe. Many places, of course, do without it cooling but the standard mode of heating in in europe is like in american cities by radiator and so most of the heat pumps which are being installed in europe are not air to air but air to water or ground to water or indeed even water to water heat pumps so you extract latent heat from the atmosphere around the building or from the ground around the building and pump that into the building during the winter to warm the uh, not the air inside the building but radiators um, and that's the type of heat pump which is being subsidized. So there are no subsidies in, in Britain for air-to-air -air heat pumps of the type that Americans would take for granted. That doesn't preclude people from using them, but that is not what government policy is supporting, precisely for the reasons, because no one in Europe wants to see a mass adoption of air conditioning. Having said that, given the impact of climate change on the European temperatures, particularly in the summer, there is going to be an increased need for air conditioning in Europe. I mean, we've seen temperatures in Spain and Portugal go over 115 degrees Fahrenheit, so 45 to 46 degrees centigrade. At that point, you know, survival begins to depend for many people on some basic form of cooling, unless you have architecture which is particularly well designed to absorb those kind of extreme heats. And London even, um, which is largely uh, unprepared for this kind of heat wave has regularly seen uh, temperatures rising into the high 90s so 36 37 degrees centigrade um, this summer and in many summers now uh, uh, in recent years and so there is going to be a need for air conditioning to adjust to climate change and the aim of the game of course is to make it as efficient as possible and one option is in fact to use radiator style cooling um, rather than the american forced air type model because radiator style cooling is more efficient. Why? Because water conducts heat better than air. So if you can use water as your principal mode for transferring heat or cooling around, then you have a more efficient system. Yeah. Anyone out there, uh, you can listen to our air conditioning episode. If you, if you scroll back through our podcast feed, I would definitely recommend that. Um, our next question comes from Alex Lynch. Hi, Adam and Cameron. It's uh, Alex here. My question is about um, these persistence of the lockdowns in places like Shanghai, where you're um, seeing this slowdown of the economy, and then it seems to be also then reducing carbon emissions quite dramatically in the short term, and whether that could be seen as a sort of degrowth economics, and um, yeah, what, what the sort of implications of that would be. Yeah, it's absolutely true that lockdowns have very abruptly reduced energy consumption and thus CO2 emissions. And to that extent, they are a kind of dress rehearsal for degrowth strategies, you could say. I mean, so China between March and May of this year saw a reduction year on year in emissions of almost 8%, 7.9%. And China is so important to global emissions, it's responsible by itself for about 29% of global emissions, that that reduction in China alone was enough to pull down global emissions year on year, very slightly, but nevertheless, it showed up. And in 2020, where we saw comprehensive lockdowns across the world economy and global output collapse by 20% in a matter of weeks, the effect was even larger. Over the whole year, we think um, CO2 emissions were reduced by about 6%. Some estimates say 5.4, others 6.4. So in that kind of ballpark. 
And so that is indeed a very substantial reduction in CO2 emissions. It's historic in scale. It's one of the largest we've ever seen. Uh, the somewhat daunting fact is that if we are to achieve our 2050 net zero ambitions, we need to reduce emissions by as much as we reduce them in 2020 every single year going forward. So that reduction in 2020 is what we should be aiming for every year. And it's daunting because 2020 was a catastrophe. So rather than seeing this as, as it were a test run of good degrowth strategy, if you like, sensible adjustment of affluent countries to the fact that you know, prioritizing GDP growth simply doesn't make sense anymore. They should be focusing on quality of life. They should be focusing on redistribution, not maximizing growth. What we saw in 2020 was really a crash test of, of a sort of disastrous policy of a sudden stop. And it was disastrous not only because it hurt the most vulnerable in society and produced some very spectacular inequality effects, not necessarily in income, but just in terms of the damage and disruption that people suffered and the labor market outcomes and the loss of income and the, the hit to emerging market and low-income countries. But it was disastrous also in that it was completely unsustainable because it was such a shock, because it was not, as it were, planned. It was not a just transition to a lower level of economic growth. It was this sudden stop. It produced this huge rebound. So 2021 saw the most rapid economic growth in the world at the world level for 50 years over 6% across the whole world economy. And the result of that, as we know, was a sudden bottleneck in the global energy economy, a huge spike in energy prices, panic about the availability of fossil fuels. And in much of the world economy, now a full pressure, full steam ahead effort to maximize fossil fuel production, which is the opposite of what we would need to drive towards degrowth and an energy transition strategy. So that kind of sudden stop produces a very severe rebound is what we've now learned. And only if you counter steer with really massive effort, which is what the Europeans are trying to do right now, can you avoid you know, a push back towards fossil fuels. Um, there's nothing that will legitimate further investment in fossil fuels, which is absolutely what we, not need, we don't need. Nothing will legitimate it more than the kind of price spike and indeed just shortages of fossil fuel that we are seeing around the world economy in the moment. We will leave it there for now. And in the meantime, bring us more questions. Go to our website and leave more. Ones and Twos is written and edited by me, Cameron Avati, along with Adam Twos. It is produced by Laura Rossbrow Tellum and Rob Sachs. Our social media manager is Claudia Tady. The executive editor of FP Podcasts is Dan Efron. This show is made possible through the support of foreign policy readers. If you're interested not just in Adam Twos, but news and analysis from around the world, consider subscribing. Ones and Twos listeners even get a 15% discount. Just go to foreignpolicy.com slash subscribe and use the promo code Twos at checkout. That is T-O-O-Z-E. And listeners, as always, we love hearing your feedback. You can send us voice messages on the Ones and Twos homepage on foreignpolicy.com, or you can email us, podcasts at foreignpolicy.com, or tweet us. That's at Ones and Twos Pod. Thanks very much for listening, and we will see you back in your feed next week.